How's everyone doing today? Good, very quietly. Well, thanks for making it out today to our great location here. Um, we're grateful to be hosted today by the Asia Pacific Foundation. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are here on the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, so yeah, welcome to the MPPGA program info session. My name is Julia Park. I am the graduate program manager of this program. And right beside me is Alexandra Berzuzinski, our graduate program coordinator. And we're joined today by two alumni members who will introduce themselves. Hey guys, uh, Ross Seibert. I'm a policy analysis and government relations specialist with Wood Fiber LNG. Um, hi, I'm Sarah Hart. I'm a financial consultant. Thank you. Thank you, you too. Um, so just a few housekeeping items before we start for real fees. Uh, when we break at around 6, we'll open up the floor for some snacking and some networking tonight. For those of you who'd like to go and visit the toilets, it's right down the hall, to the right, and then to the right. So as you know, the Master of Public Policy program is a professional program within the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at the University of uh, British Columbia. Can't forget the name of my university. Um, so throughout this session, we'll be inviting you to ask questions about the program, but also telling you about the various components of our new and budding program. I have a slew of chocolates from our center today to hand out to people who are able to answer some of my questions. So keep an eye out. UBC is a global center for research, innovation, and teaching, and we are consistently ranked among the top 40 best universities in the world. Not only is UBC a top university, it's also located in one of the most interesting cities in the world, Vancouver. We're drawing on Vancouver and UBC's unique location as an Asia Pacific gateway, and we equipped the next generation of global leaders with the multidisciplinary policy skills that 21st century challenges demand. So during the next hour, we'll be asking um, you about your questions, talking about who we are, what the MPPGA program can offer you, and how we build future policy change makers around the world. Um, yeah, so thanks for coming. We'll just give you, we'll just begin with a simple program overview. But before we do, I have two questions. Who can guess when the MPPGA program was launched? Fairly recently, but in which year? Any guesses? Yes, lady in the back. 2017. Oh, sorry, close. No. Yes. 2014. Uh, no, very close. 2015. 2015, precisely. Thank you. What's your name? My name is Thomas, and I love chocolate. Thomas, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah, you're doing enough to come here. I'll throw it to you. Don't worry. Um, great. Second question. Who knows how long the MPPG program takes? Um, uh, 20 months. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You nailed it. Here you are. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very bad at catching anything. Okay, I can ask you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Fantastic. So yes, we will go on to our information. Who are we? Um, the MPPJ program is a full-time, two-year program. It launched in September 2015. It means that students in our program, so it's a professional program, which means that students in our program don't have a supervisor and don't need to write a thesis. Um, instead, they'll be researching on a global policy project which takes them around the world or all over Canada to work with clients and come up with their group members uh, with a policy proposal. So some of our students are doing that right now. I'll also be joining some of our students on their project. And so it'll be a great opportunity for you to do some hands-on experience and policy preparation and analysis. The NPPGA program offers students three streams that they can specialize in. The three streams are development and social change, resources, energy, and sustainability, and global governance and security. We hope that students leave the MPPG program knowing how to apply multidisciplinary policy analysis and creative design skills to create, implement, and evaluate public policy, articulate ethical guidelines to guide policy analysis in a way that acknowledges and respects cultural differences navigate domestic and global policy settings and interactions between the two, and collaborate successfully with clients and stakeholders. So 
Within the first year of the program, all of our students take the same courses. They'll be taking four classes in the first semester, and then four classes in the second semester. And we do this to ensure that everyone starts off their policy career with a good start, with a stable foundation, where people will learn how to write policy briefs, research research methods, and learn about ethical processes, and policy analysis and evaluation in a domestic and global framework. It's the second year of the program that all of our students sort of get into each of their specific streams. For example, if someone goes into a program saying, I want to be a policy leader in sustainability, or I want to become a policy leader in US-China relations, we have classes that target each specific area of this cool big behemoth of policy challenges. Um, it's really in the second year that people will get into the nitty gritty of these subject areas. Now in second year we also have a really exciting project called the Global Policy Project. We'll get into that later. But before that, we just need to mention that we've been going through a curriculum refresh. Um, an application has been sent to the UBC Senate and we expect that changes will occur from September 2020 onwards. A large part of this curriculum refresh that we're doing is to incorporate more professional development into our program to make sure that we can grow the soft skills within a policy education, not just within the classroom. And we do this because we constantly collaborate and discuss with policy partners, one of them being Asia Pacific Foundation, in hearing about what they need from their employees, whether that's networking or negotiation skills, conflict management or teamwork. So before we get into global policy, we had a video for you, but it's not playing today, sadly. If you have access to YouTube sometime, please check out our YouTube channel. It has lots of videos, including about the global policy project. But before we do, who here has heard of GP Squared or the global policy project? Does anyone have any ideas? No one? GP Squared. Some of you were reading our brochures. What might it be? Yes. Yeah, so the global policy project is basically you go and work with um, actual experts in the field and you're working with an organization who presents to you a policy problem and you have to sort of figure out methodologies and evaluation to sort of uh, find a real solution. Yes. yes, that was almost exactly it. Thank you so much for that great answer. Would you like to know? I don't want to throw no. okay. people like that. Great. Thank you so much. So yes, we put our students into groups in their second year. It'll be like an awesome group project. But as part of the group project, you go to an exotic location, or less exotic. Some of our students went to Alberta last year. Uh, and you work with a client, whether in the private or public sector, to come up with solutions for a policy challenge that they have. And in the process of that, you constantly network and negotiate with your partners and stakeholders, come up with draft reports, work with faculty members, there will be a faculty member assigned to you, and you'll come up with a policy proposal that addresses this challenge in a cohesive and multidisciplinary way. And in the process of this, you'll be doing field work at the site, interviewing stakeholders, coming up with different variables and different statistics and doing research on the background of this policy challenge and come up with a result and a presentation that we that will be presented to all of our partners as part of a GP squared symposium at the end of the year. So we have had students work on some really cool things, some of which have actually contributed to real policies taking place. Some examples of past projects from last year includes uh, towards equitable and sustainable integrated water resource management policies with the National Water Authority with the government of Peru, or policy options for a just transition for Alberta's <coughs> oil sands workers and communities with the Alberta Federation of Labor. And up on the screen, we have the current year's projects. We just had students who are going to achieve global gender justice with the Women's Initiative for Gender Justice to The Hague this week. I myself will be leaving with one of our teams for ease of business travel and visa access between Canada and the ASEAN nations for the CAPC in Singapore. And then I'll go on to work with our Nepal team who will be working with an NGO devoted to open 
learning in Nepal. So we have lots of cool projects taking place. And so, yeah, this is the final project that our students deal with at the end of their degree. And it's unique to us at UBC at the MPPGA program. And largely dependent on the networks and connections of our faculty and administrative heads. So since we have two wonderful alumni with us, wonderful successful alumni who are able to graduate the program and finish their projects, we have a few questions for you. Um, tell us a bit about the projects that you worked on. Okay, so I worked with the city of Vancouver um, on the renewable city strategy and the policy problem that we had to work with was how to reduce carbon emissions by 50% by 2030. Um, but the project was specifically targeting how to reduce carbon emissions from vehicles, so we were looking at ways to um, reduce, well, to electrify fleets in Vancouver. And we did the jurisdictional scan of the top performing cities around the world on how they managed to read their fleets. Um, so we did interviews with stakeholders um, and policymakers, and then came up with recommendations for the city. Wow. What about you, Ross? Uh, so my team worked with an uh, NGO uh, called Free the Slaves. Um, they have uh, branches in different parts of the world. Our team was specifically in Ghana. Um, there they have issues of child trafficking, particularly in the uh, around Lake Volta in the middle of the country. Um, our team was set out to assess one of the evaluation tools that they use to uh, look at communities after children have been returned. Uh, they assess the communities to see their economic resiliency, um, if there are instances of trafficking again, and what the conditions uh, that could lead to those, uh, to re-trafficking are. Um, and we took this tool uh, and essentially rebuilt it from the ground up for them. Wow. So for both of you, how would you say GP Squared helped you grow as a professional? If it did, it might not have. Um, I think some of the key takeaways from that project was that you get to work with team members that you don't necessarily choose. So it teaches, teaches you a lot of team building skills, which is something I'm sure for everyone that's already started their careers knows that working with a team can be difficult and you have to ma like try to find a balance and um, manage something that works for everyone. So in our team, for example, we decided to have the project leader and the project coordinator to make sure everything flows and we meet our deadlines because everyone has their own busy schedules and there are no set deadlines for like internally we have to do our own um, so yeah team building skills uh, a lot of the courses that we took were directly applicable for example um, the policy analysis and evaluation and, like how to define a problem statement so that your research is more specific and well written. Um, yeah, and other things that <laughs> I can't remember. That's really valid. We had a um, policy stakeholder from Ottawa visit us this year, and something interesting that she said was, "We need we need employees who are experts in teamwork." And you would think, I learned teamwork in kindergarten. Why would I need to learn teamwork again in grad school and shell out thousands of dollars to learn it? But really when you go into the workforce, working around really sensitive issues in a time-sensitive manner, there's a lot of stress. I think people place a lot of emphasis on seeing people who have gone through this process of learning how to work around these issues in a really constructive, communicative way. What about you, Ross? Yeah, I guess on, in our case, um, what I took away from it was really being able to prioritize um, the Prioritize the goal, which in practical terms, you know, we're, a lot of what we were doing was designing this survey system um, and being able to, you know, you have hundreds of questions that you might want to ask and in reality you only have maybe an hour or two to ask these surveys and so really being able to uh, sit there and whittle it down to the, to the exact best specifics that you need. Um, I don't know what that skill would be called, but uh, sort of a time management as well, but uh, I mean, in our case, we were we rebuilt the survey in the field like three or four times. It was a over the other day we were reassessing our work, so um, that was something I think we got really good at. Right. Um, 
right? So being really adaptable on the field, working yeah. with stakeholders, yeah. prioritizing. Yeah. Great. Does anyone else here today have any questions about GP Squared for our alumni? No? That's fine. We have lots of opportunities for questions near the end. Hi, you know, we do. Uh, yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, how big were your teams? Like, you're talking about teams that they have signed the same project? We had, uh, we had five yeah. on my team, which I think every team, everybody had five, four or five yeah. people. Okay. Maybe one was six, but yeah. Right. So you say that you didn't have a, sorry for your name, but uh, you <coughs> said that you didn't have opportunity to choose with who you work with, and Well, they give us topics and then you choose the topics you would like, yeah. say you like, prefer topic A and B and then whoever chooses that, they're going to have to do so oh, yes. But you did have the opportunity to choose what topic you would be working with. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We wouldn't send you to Timbuktu without gaining your interest areas <laughs> and considering what you would like to do. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I have a speak with uh, Sashi. And he mentioned that, like, in case that you don't have a, a topic that you really are into, and uh, you have time or you have some kind of network and you, you can, like, develop your own GP. Um, how factible is that? Do you sign your experience, like, a, maybe a classmate that he built his own GP and make their own connections? Yeah, we all yeah. join the team. I don't remember anything happening. Yeah. Like, coming up with their own. Yeah, so the process of GT Squared is very early on in the year. Our graduate director sends out a call for our faculty members to join with us as part of this class component. Each of our faculty members work with our graduate director to bring in clients, policy stakeholders, who would like to partner with our school. And so it's very much of a structured institutional process where we um, see the partner's ability to host our students, the safety level, the ability to institutionally support this project and this team in this location. And so once those opportunities are found, those tend to number between 10 to 15 opportunities, we send out a survey to the students asking them which project would you like to do, please list your preferences, and our coordinator takes those responses away, puts them into teams, and then we actually eliminate maybe around half of those opportunities. So that's sort of the process behind your final project. It's very structured and sort of organized in that way. I hope that answers your question. Uh, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so it sounds like very much you were, you were actually doing the work. None of it sounds theoretical. Um, did you have a chance to apply the solutions that you recommended? Did you see any success? Uh, in our case, we didn't get to run our final tool. Um, we left that with uh, the NGO, with Free the Slaves. Um, from what I understand, that, that tool is in uh, practice or it's in out of practice now. I don't know if they've applied it across all of their all the countries that they work in. Um, but yeah, I mean, while we were there, again, like I said, we were uh, very much sort of doing this iterative process with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it take being able to take, like you said, like theory and actually, I mean, a lot of what we did we're not sitting there reading uh, articles, scientific articles and stuff in the field. We're, we're trying to put it together. We have a hand at the back of this. Oh, yeah. um, I just want to add, uh, you decided to go to Ghana with a nonprofit. That's a fairly significant kind of decision. And I was wondering what really drove, I guess, your interest in the sort of human development and like social impact kind of space, and would you do that kind of opportunity again? Uh, to the second question, yes, I absolutely would. Um, and to your first one, that's a that's, that's kind of more of like a, a life story thing. I have a family of, of people that have worked in public service. Before I came here, I worked in public service myself. And so in that regard, the project um, to me seemed to have the most sort of social good associated with it. And that's definitely what drove me to it. Cool. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I'm a 
Um, yeah, are we okay to move on or should we? Well, actually, just bouncing off that question. So yeah. you mentioned you had a background in uh, social service previously, yeah. public service previously. Uh, what do you see in the NPP that uh, you thought might accelerate that career, or what would you drive us for going into it, given you already had a background in that, that field? Uh, honestly, it was the GP squared. Uh, because a lot of the other MPPs that are out there um, are, you know, there's a thesis at the end of it, and this is actually my second master's degree that I did, and um, the first one was like a 78-page paper, and I was sort of thinking, I don't really I want to do that again. That was grueling, and I, I didn't really feel like I got a whole lot of practical value out of that, and so yeah, the GP squared definitely drew me into it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, we get that. Yeah, I have a question about the course. So, um, who, who decides um, what projects, project topics? So, let's say, like, if I have a, a topic, like, I identify a policy challenge in a certain country, and I would like to work on that with um, a team of people, can I suggest a project topic? We try to work with projects that have established project leads that involves a client on the field and an executive level leader of that organization willing to meet with our students and allocate resources to us while they're there. So it's a, it's a project with a lot of criteria. If students can come and suggest a lead that has and meets all of those requirements, I think our graduate director would be open to that. So far, we haven't had a situation like that happening. Thank you. Um, so now we go on to another exciting aspect of our degree called professional development. Before we do, I'm going to ask a question again. Do you have any guesses on what kinds of professional development opportunities we offer our students? Cool, please. Co-op placements? Co-op, yes, precisely. Can you I pass it to you? Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Save my bad. Thank you. Um, yes, anyone else? We offer several. Yes, very many. Yes. I have a, um, I, you, you work with the actual experts in the field, people come in, people want to do multidisciplinary kind of multiple learning methods. Um, a lot of people who practice policy actually come lecture and they do workshops, etc. Absolutely, yes. We invite, um, thank you. We actually invite policy practitioners to come join us. One of the most favorite event series that we had last year for me was we actually got four or five female consul generals in Vancouver to come for a panel event on talking about gender and foreign policy. So funny because all of them were like, well, it's a total coincidence that I have no children, you know, I'm not married, <laughs> I'm in this field, it's very grueling. But it was just such a candid opportunity to like look into that field of work, into that world, and the reasons behind why people choose these, these roles. And so those kinds of opportunities were really cool. You know, just this September, we had an orientation event called the Policy Salon where we invited various school partners, including consul generals, again, and um, a director level staff of Global Affairs Canada. They just came to come and hang out with our students, network with them, and possibly mentor them down the line. So it was a great opportunity for them. We also have had some famous people from the States. That's the thing that we do. It's called the LIND Initiative. We had Naomi Klein in conversation with one of the professors at UBC that we have. Catherine Retzinger to talk about climate action and climate change. We have um, we have another Lind initiative series coming up soon. It's a different theme every year, but we do have the funding to bring in really big names to trigger some discussions on campus that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do in different departments, which is a real treat. We also regularly fund our students to go to different competitions and different conferences including CAPA case competitions. We had our students go to um, Ottawa for the Canadian Association of Programs in Public Administration. We, uh, this year, we also had four students go over to the NASPA Batten student simulation competition, 
that year it was held in Austin, Texas. And we had an offshoot of their GP Square project. We had two student leads go and present on the possibilities of an ASEAN Canada free trade agreement. And they, yeah, they presented as UBC project leads based on that. And some of their work has gone to inform a lot of work based on that department in Global Affairs Canada, which is really cool. We regularly also have students who attend the Vision 20 conference all over the world. They recently traveled to Paris, Japan, Washington, D.C., Berlin, and the Brookings Institution in New York City. It's much more worldly than I am, actually. We also have two different mentorship programs that happen throughout the year. First year students are matched with a faculty mentor. So although we don't have faculty supervisors, we make sure that they have some one-on-one -on -one time with faculty supervisors that they can go to for advice and just kinship within an academic setting. We also have a professional mentorship program which happens for second year students. That's an option for people who would like that opportunity, but we have executive and director level um, partners come and mentor our students. We also have a designated career and co-ops advisor. She works just across from me in our office and she is devoted, she's dedicated to our degree. And so she meets with the students one-on-one -on -one every year when they come into the program to identify their career aspirations and sort of tailor that journey to that aspiration throughout the two-year program, which is really, really cool. She also um, organizes co-op placements. Co-ops is really unique to our program as well. And some MPPGA students who have participated in co-op have acquired internships at the United Nations Association in Canada, Global Affairs Canada, Gold Corps, and here, the Asia Pacific uh, Foundation in Canada. And just a note about UN internships, we care deeply about equity and access to opportunities at UBC. And as part of this program, we provide subsidies and stipends to students who are selected to go on UN internships. So now we go on to more questions for alumni. So I encourage you to think of questions for alumni in the section of professional development as well. What skills would you say you gained from the PD aspect of this program? Um, well, a lot of what you've mentioned, uh, taking the opportunity to go to all the workshops and the seminars that were provided. Uh, I also had the opportunity to be a fellow with the Vision 20, and I managed to go to the Paris Peace Forum and uh, T20 in Tokyo, where it, uh, Professor Yves was uh, allowing the students the opportunity to go and meet with different stakeholders at different levels, government, decision makers. It was a great experience um, and a huge learning curve for me. Mm, that's amazing. Can you elaborate a bit on what Vision 20 is and what they do? Uh, Vision 20 is a platform uh, that the professor created to try to engage youth in global governance topics. So he really wants, um, he has this vision that young people are going to be the change makers in the world. So he really wants to engage them all these conferences where it's mostly high-level people doing all the discussion. Um, yeah, and then we also had uh, a workshop uh, given by an expert on how to present and, like presentation skills, and she yeah, gave us a lot of tips before our GP squared presentation on how to present and how to visually Lay out your, your information so it's not too text heavy and like keeping the and like everything from body language to right right. Yeah. I attended that seminar this year. It was so specific and practical. She actually showed us photos of Angela Merkel doing this pose. Apparently, this is a power pose. So that's one takeaway I got. What about you, Ross? Um, I would say off the top of my head, adaptability mm -hmm. um, and. That's something that I am definitely applying now in my current role. Um, sort of, a, obviously, like policy analysis, government relations, but um, doing a, a bit of everything within our team um, and becoming sort of a jack of all trades. And um, yeah, that's the, I think that's the biggest takeaway. What do you think was your favorite opportunity or event that you encountered during the degree? Um, I, I went to the, the John, John Kasich uh, talk. 
Um, and for those of you who don't know, John Kasich uh, was a Republican presidential candidate in the US. Um, and myself coming out of uh, DC in politics. Um, that was that was fun because I got to butt heads with him a little bit. Oh, did you ask yeah. him a few questions? Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. Oh, that was fun. Really fun. Yeah. That's great. And actually, the, just to mention that the networking event that was provided by the program uh, is how I ended up getting a job. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I remember being part of a roundtable discussion with NPPG students and poli sci students at our school with Elizabeth May. It was maybe a group of 10 people. She was just here in one of our offices. And she just talked candidly about being a woman in politics, what she thought of the upcoming election, and just thoughts like that were a casual, incredible opportunity to walk into uh, throughout the program as well. Does anyone else have any professional development questions for alumni? No? Not for the time? Yeah, yes. Can you explain like, how it works? Like, everybody can apply. Um, I don't know anything about the co-op program. Oh, the co-op program, yes, it's by application. So um, you apply to be part of the co-op program, and then once you're accepted, you apply to specific positions, and then there's no guarantee that the positions will choose you, but on an average, we have around three positions per applicant. I think that was the ratio. We have far more opportunities that are available than people applying to them, as a rule. So do you apply that like before, like when you get accepted, or at the second year, when that takes place? You apply in your first year, yeah. And then people usually carry out their co-op in between first and second year, maybe throughout the summer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how much important is um, like uh, having academic knowledge on economics or statistics uh, for this program? As I was a law student back in my home country and worked as a judge there, so. It's obvious that I don't have any academic knowledge on economics or statistics or whatsoever. So is it a problem here? Yeah, um, Alex, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, um, so in your first year of the program, you will take microeconomics, macroeconomics, and statistics. And um, you need to have at least a beginner knowledge before entering those courses, because otherwise it's going to be a really rough learning curve. <laughs> Um, so our recommendation is that you have those skills before submitting your application, that's ideal. Um, however, given that our application is only a couple months out, um, if you don't have those skills at this time, you're still welcome to apply to the program with your econ and stats as it is. Um, and then just in that section of the forum where we ask you to talk about your skills, let the committee know that if admitted, you will take a course in the summer before beginning the program. And then our expectation is that you will follow through on that. And so then you'll come to the program prepared to take our econ and stats courses. Yeah. Yes. Um, question for the one hand. Do you have a specific field of study you wanted to um, go more into through the program before applying? And were you able to kind of follow through with? For example, let's say you wanted to look at um, education in a specific region, education reform. Did you have that in mind beforehand, or was sort of more so going to be in that professional experience before? Um, in my case, um, yes. I, I, I looked at the, I did the governance and security track, um, and that's sort of where my background was, and, and I came in sort of hoping to develop that. And, um, I was what I, what I liked about the program is that the profs are happy to let you sort of pick a lot of what you want to write on um, and and choose your research subjects. So I felt like I was able to sort of guide myself in what in what I enjoyed. Um, some cases, like I, I branched out a little bit. I remember writing a paper on uh, space policy, which um, maybe some has a bit of a security component to it, but it was something I never <coughs> dived into. Um, space nerd, so I thought, I'll, I'll try that, I'll try my hand that, so, yeah. Yeah, um, with me it was, I, I had a lot of interest, so I was very interested in uh, migration policies and 
policies. policies. So with the streams, it was hard for me to choose one specific one. But what I liked about the program was it was very flexible, and you can choose the courses that you like. And during my time on exchange, I also got to like I had a lot more choices. On it's important to note that our faculty members are a really essential part of developing this part of your careers, actually. You know, when we go through admissions every year, some of our faculty members will come to us and say, oh, let me know who's interested in China, let me know who's interested in security, like, let me know who's interested in whatsoever. It's grad school, so professors are very invested in what people will be coming into the program with as potential partners and as proteges. You know, we had some of our professors just got to take a whole bunch of our students to Huawei in China recently, and that was an incredible opportunity for them, but also an opportunity for Huawei to meet with budding policy leaders, and so this program sort of becomes a gateway for those opportunities. We also encourage students coming into the program to seek out professors whose research interests match yours. Um, we have one student who was really interested in climate change in fish, and he found one professor that had that same interest and made it work. He worked as a research assistant for him, worked as an after graduation. Um, so definitely, it's worth your while to find those professors and mm -hmm. seek them out. They're usually very open to that. They are, yes. Um, just a continuation about the question about economics. Would, it, would you recommend, like, a, let's say, a first 100 year level, like, kind of a first year level, or like more of an intermediate micro and macro economic like 300 level of fish? What's your equivalency of like recommended? Um, our our recommendation is the equivalent of like a 100 level um, undergraduate course in economic stats, like an intro to economics or statistics. Um, yeah, I don't. I, if you want to go further and do like a 200 or a 300 level. That's perfectly fine, um, but our base would be a 100 level. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry, Russ. As you say, with the statistics and the economics, um, don't don't let it scare you. Um, I, I had no background in statistics before I started. I did the summer course, um, and the stats professor Kai, he was fantastic. In, in uh, I mean, we had a we had a diverse group, so some people were very comfortable in statistics. Um, and others, like myself, were, were sort of were very overwhelmed, a little worried about it going in. And Kai, he was great. The props were great walking us through it. Um, so don't like, don't let it freak you out if you haven't done it before. Like, the program is there to help, for sure. We're also used to students who come in without a background in stats and economics. So we have a variety of different support mechanisms. One of them is the peer-assisted student study sessions. I think that's what it was called, we call it PASS. So it's a, we have a second year student every year to do self-led study and sort of do tutorials in econ and stats every year that students can go to every week outside of tutorials, meetings with their TA and lectures. And you had a question, sir? Yeah, I'm confused um, because you've got a department of political science at the master's level and PhD level. And you also have international relations at the PhD level. <coughs> Um, how do, I, what's, I'm just trying to kind of get an understanding of why we have a public policy in the as well. Yes. Are those two integrate exactly what you're doing. Um, yeah, so at UBC, we only have an undergrad level uh, opportunity for people who wish to study international relations. For poli sci, yes, we do offer MAs and PhDs. The MA in poli sci is a one year program that requires students to take. 18 credits in a graduate level study and 12 credits in the thesis of their choice. And so like we mentioned, this is a very typical Master of Arts program where you are assigned to a professor, you work with them throughout the year, you write something of an 80 page thesis, and you take around six graduate courses that include topics in Canadian government, political theory, political philosophy and whatnot. I would say curriculum-wise, it's vastly different from what we offer. So when did they take up the master's and the PhD element of the national relations? Um, I'm not familiar with that. Alex, would you be? Uh, I'm not familiar either. I think um, that's probably a question better asked of political science. Um, they'll know the background of their courses. This public policy really falls within the realm of political science. Uh, I mean, certainly, like undergrads 
from political science and international relations are really interested in our program. Um, we have the genius of because we're a professional program. Um, it sets us apart from research-based programs in that we have a really strong focus on building out those practical skills that research programs don't necessarily integrate. Um, so if you're looking to go from this program into a career, uh, we're going to prepare you for that. If you're looking to go on to a PhD, then our research uh, program is probably going to be good. Well, I used to work for global affairs and you know, you know, political science on used to draw out of that. Uh, so I'm just trying to, when did your program start? 2015. 2015. Yeah, September 2015. Okay, so I work for global affairs, export development, we drew heavily from UBC's IR and you know, the science <coughs> program. So in some sense, you're cannibalizing your part. Well, we have one class in our undergrad program in poli sci about policy. I assume it's quite theoretical. We, I don't believe we have a graduate level course on actually creating policy. I'm sure that it also reflects the evolution of policy making over the years in policy education. Previously, we had very similar kinds of people getting a similar kind of education going into policy making. Now we see that we require people to be creative, we require people to come from different lived experiences, and we're constantly experimenting as a university how to bring together an education program that best befits what policy, policy employers and institutions are asking <coughs> from us to come up with policy practitioners. And so I think that kind of reflects the evolution of how our program has come and how the degrees, the NPP degrees, have come to evolve. So what is political science doing then? Um, I'm sure you can ask political science. Is this effectively is political science? No, we're a separate department. From yeah, we're a separate department, but yeah. it's still umbrella. I can give you the graduate program manager's email for public science, actually. His name is Adam Jelly. Yeah. yeah. Yes? Sorry, I'm short, so I'm going to stand. So for Sarah and Ross, I just wanted to know how beneficial was the program in obtaining your current careers? Like, would you be able to get the jobs you have now without this master's, or do you think it was literally what got you the positions you're in now? I mean, I can't say 100% for certain, but, um, well, uh, the firm that I was working for actually reached out to me because they saw my profile on the MPBG website, and they saw that my background and skills were applicable to the position that they were looking for. And I also got to meet my employer networking session, so I would say there is a very high correlation there. Um, but, yeah, so, most probably. I think in, in my case, it was a bit of a mix. Um, I came from uh, working in U.S. politics before, so I had some professional development there, but in terms of uh, uh, my current job, I definitely think the program helped. Um, it uh, it helped develop my uh, analysis abilities. Um, and my previous degrees were in international relations um, and can talk to you all day about neorealist and realist theories of, of that, but um, I don't know how that, that wasn't super useful even in my time in the, in the government, in the Senate. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely think this program it, it fleshed out a lot of those other skills and um, you know, it kept me around in Canada too. So, yes, because you're American. Yeah. Okay. Not Trump. Pull factor, no pushback. Okay. Great. Well, <laughs> since we're sort of running low on time, we're going to move on to admission requirements. I'm sure all of you are interested in how to apply and how to strengthen your application. So we'll take it away to Alex. Okay. Um, so before we start, another question opportunity. Um, who knows what our application deadline is this year? Thirty first January. Okay, wait. Sorry. Maybe one at a time. January thirtieth. Yes. Yes. Is correct. That's right, yes. So, there you are. Over. Um, our application deadline is January 30th. Uh, that is the deadline to submit your application form, your supporting documents, so your transcripts, your resume, uh, as well as the deadline for your referees to submit their reference letters. Um, that's really important to remember, um, especially if you're submitting your application closer to the deadline. Make sure that you talk to your referees about how much time they're going to need before this deadline is uh, yeah, very important date to keep in mind. So, uh, admission requirements for the program. Um, for anyone applying, we look for um, applicants that have the equivalent of a four-year bachelor's degree. 
Uh, we accept um, a whole variety of academic backgrounds, uh, as you can see from the side. Um, we get a lot of political science, but we also get a lot of students from other, uh, other uh, academic disciplines. Uh, I think some of the more uh, out there ones that we've seen that we've accepted into the program would be like religious studies. Uh, I think we had an applicant who was a music major once. Um, yeah, and so what we look for from you is to tell us how your academic background, as well as your professional background, because we accept all different professional backgrounds as well, um, how they've prepared you for an MPGA degree and how they've made you interested in public policy. Um, so what about your background has gotten you to this point where you want to be in this program? Um, the minimum GPA that we look for is 76%. That's about an E-plus average. Uh, if you attended a Canadian institution or a U.S. institution for your undergrad, we'll calculate your GPA based on your 300 and 400 level courses. If you attended an international institution, we'll calculate it based on your entire transcript. Um, for anyone who attended an international institution with the language of instruction for your program and is not English, um, you will need to submit English language test scores. We have our minimum requirements out there for the scores that we uh, accept. And we accept test scores that are valid within 24, the past 24 months. Um, so uh, with English language really quick, you'll be asked to self-report your test scores in the application form as well as submit an official copy to graduate and postdoctoral studies and you can contact your testing center to do that directly. Um, just going back to GPA for a quick moment, um, one of the questions that we get a lot from applicants is that they're worried about their GPA, it's either right at the minimum or just below, they're not quite sure if they're still eligible to apply. Um, if you are in that situation, we still encourage you to apply to the program. Um, because we're a professional program, we review your entire application before we make an admission decision. So that includes your professional experience, your essay responses, whether or not you have a common stats background, um, your reference letters, the whole package. We look at it and then we make an admission decision. So if your GPA is right at the minimum or slightly below, you could still be a really strong candidate for the program if you excel in the other areas of your application form. Um, so yeah, we definitely encourage everyone to apply. All right. Um, when you are submitting your application, uh, it's one thing that it's important to know is that uh, we don't look at anything until after the application deadline. So definitely take your time when submitting your application. Make sure that you're really confident in your essay responses. Make sure that the application is as strong as it can be. Um, we're going to ask for a few things in your application package. Uh, on the form, we ask you to answer three essay style questions. Um, they ask you to talk about some policy issues. They ask you to talk about your academic and professional background, as well as your uh, career goals and where you see yourself in a policy issue in uh, 10 years. Uh, we ask you to choose a program screen, uh, the three that we listed before, the ones that you choose from. Uh, we ask you to list all of your post-secondary um, institutions that you've attended in the academic history section. So this includes like if you went on exchange, if you transferred out of an institution or a your degree, if you just did that one-off course one summer because you wanted to learn French, like, all of that's got to be included. Um, make sure they're all separate entries in your academic history, and make sure that you upload a transcript for each institution that you're putting in your academic history. Uh, so even if you went on exchange and the credits are in your home university transcript, we need a transcript from that exchange institution. Um, just things to consider as you're gathering all of your documents. Um, we're going to ask you to upload uh, an up-to-date copy of your resume or CV. And uh, like I mentioned before, to self-report your English language test scores if applicable. And then uh, lastly, we're going to ask for the three, or for contact details for three referees. Um, when you're choosing, or when you're uh, providing an email address for your referees, <coughs> if they have a company or an institutional email address, we recommend using those because it will give them access to the online submission platform. The online platform, it'll take them 10 minutes, they can submit the reference, it's really easy. 
Uh, if your referee only has like, a Gmail or a Hotmail or a Yahoo type of email address, they're not going to be able to access it for security reasons, and they're going to have to mail in a hard copy of their letter. Um, so that's obviously a much lengthier process, and they'll need to make sure that it's mailed in in time for that January 30th deadline. So if they have if they have a company or institution email, ask them if you can use that one. It will make the process a lot easier for everyone. Um, okay, and uh, oh, and then a couple other things about references. Um, so once you um, once you submit your application and pay the application fee, instructions will be automatically sent to all of your referees on how they can submit their letters along with the deadline that they need to submit it by. Um, I do always recommend to stay on top of your referees, especially if you're submitting closer to the deadline. Um, in the My Application um, platform, you can check to see who submitted reference letters and who hasn't. And if they haven't, get in touch with them. Just constantly stay in contact. Uh, especially academic referees, they get tons and tons of requests. So you want to make sure that you're staying top of mind. Um, yeah. I think that's everything that I have for instructions on how to apply and what our requirements are. Yes, question. That's a good question. Um, if one of the referees has only the personally like Yahoo mail or whatever, will they still be contacted to say you have to mail it or will they just not be contacted? They'll still be contacted, okay. but yeah, the instructions will be how to mail yeah. in a paper copy. Okay. Um, referees who are mailing in a paper copy, they can do that at any point in time. So if you know that you're going to be um, submitting your application like a few days before the deadline, tell them to just mail your letter now. We'll hold on to it and we'll add it to your application when it comes in. Yes? Uh, do you need sealed copies of the letters or just scans? Oh, um, for the application review, scans are fine. It should be scanned of your original transcript. If you're offered a place in the program, that's when we'll need the sealed, co the sealed hard copy. Uh, with regard to referees, is there any requirement around uh, professional versus uh, academic referees for a preference? Oh, um, so on our website we have some guidelines uh, based on how many years it's been since you've graduated. Uh, so I think it's like if you're within two or three years, they recommend all our academic. Um, but the reality is it's up to you to decide who's going to best represent you. So for example, if you're straight out of undergrad, but you did a co-op, at the government, and you have a really great professional reference, go ahead and use that referee. Um, the strong recommendation that we make is have at least one academic reference. Even if you've been out of school for a number of years, um, it's an academically rigorous program, so it's important for the committee to know what you're like in the classroom. So that's where that academic reference is really important. Okay, and can that be an academic that knows you? Or, so in my case, I've been out of school for more than 10 years. And I did a bachelor's degree, so I doubt that if any of the professors are still alive, that they remember me. Um, so, in that scenario, would you take entirely professional references, or should I start cozying up to uh, some academics in the next year? Um, academic referees should be uh, instructors who taught you in a course that you like successfully mm -hmm. completed. Um, so. Probably not just a professor who knows you, because um, that would be more of a character reference, or potentially a professional reference if you worked for them. Um, you might want to email about your situation. We can talk about that's that. That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I saw that in the application way. guidelines and wondered whether that might help me out. Yeah. Um, I'll give you the program email after. Okay. Uh, do I need to submit any? Uh, uh, I mean, any certificate from the registrar of my university if uh, English is the primary language of my university? Um, I mean, do I need to sit for the language test then? It would be helpful, especially if it's from a country where there are multiple languages of instruction. It would be helpful. If you I mean, a certificate from the registrar or the controller of the examination? Oh, um, that I'm not too sure. I'll have to check. Um, I think it might be best if you know. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, if you were to apply as an international student and then gain permanent residency in Canada between the time of application and the start of the program, um, how would you be treated as an international student in terms of ease or? Uh, oh, 
Um, my understanding is that once you get your permanent residency card, you can take that to graduate and postdoctoral studies, and they'll change your status. And so from that point going forward, you'll be treated as a domestic student in terms of tuition fees. But if you're currently an international student, you'll still have to apply and pay the application um, fee for international students. And depending on how the card arrives, you might pay the first tuition installment as an international student. Yeah, it's up to the point where I think we got the card. Yes? Uh, when is the next intake session? Uh, September 2021. So this is for September 2020, and after that it will be September 2021. And it will be a similar application um, time, right? Like it will be around January 20. I believe so. Um, do you think you're following the same pattern for 2021? For applications? Yeah, yeah. for start and close with deadlines? Yeah, more or less, yes. So there is just one intake every year? Yes. Yeah, because of the way the program structure, we like everyone to move sort of together, so we just do a September intake. Uh, do you have any tips for the essay questions mm -hmm. in terms of? Kind of how we go about responding to that because there are not a lot of I, I know that the character is not that much so yes. we kind of have to do this thing so if you have some tips on what we should try to do. Um, I I recommend writing a lot of drafts just you know write everything you want to write and just keep condensing it down. Um, what what the committee is really looking for from your essay responses is for you to tell us like, what you've done academically and professionally, what you would like to do in terms of your career, and how our program specifically can help bridge that gap. So as you're answering the questions, um, if like overall if that you're kind of covering that, that would probably fine. Mm -hmm. Definitely. We've admitted people with zero policy experience, but with those answers, we're mainly looking for English proficiency and fit. So if you can demonstrate your resolve and your ability within that boundary, then go with it. Um, and as you're looking back at your academic and, um, and your professional experience, uh, don't be afraid to like look beneath like, the surface of like what your job description was or where you worked or what your degree was and look at the transferable skills that come from that. Um, or look at the different ways that you may have interacted with policy. Um, because policy is built into every job. Like, we deal with policy every single day in our jobs, but we're not policy makers in like, the government sense. So um, we've had some applicants that have had some really creative answers to how policy, how they have found policy in the job, how they've created policy interacted with it. So definitely, um, yeah, feel free to be creative <coughs> We'll just take our last question because the session is coming to a close. Yes. Uh, okay. I, was, I was just curious for, let's say if I were to apply and got accepted, but I'm an international student right now, and before the like due dates for the fees are, are in, like um, what if I do get the permanent like, PR card right away, then would, would I still be subjected to the international fee because I applied as an international student, or if I just contact the right sources, will I be paying the permanent resident? Um, once graduate studies gets a copy of your permanent residency card, I believe they change your status right away, and from that day forward, you okay. are charged according to what your visa status is. Okay. That's that's my understanding, though. Um, graduate and postdoctoral studies will have a better idea of what that formal process looks like. What is the tuition for you? Um, I believe domestic students are now. 40, somewhere else, 45, I believe also. Yeah, forty-five thousand dollars for the entire degree for yeah. domestic, and around seventy-two thousand for an international student. Yeah. All of this is on our website. Yes, uh, it's on our. If you want the exact numbers and the breakdown of what it's going to look like for year one, two, or two, it's on the tuition and funding uh, section of our website. All right. So to close our session today, we'll just go on to the topic of <coughs> alumni. Alumni, where are they today? And so some people speak about our program as if having um, a very new program is a bad thing, but I say it's a good thing because all of our alumni are always close by and willing to help out, such as Ross. You know, we were supposed to have someone else come join us for the panel today, and he got sick. So Ross just came in at the last minute. So we maintain very close ties. It's a very tight-knit family all across the world, in Ottawa, in New York, or 
in Beijing, for example. We've had our alumni serve as policy analysts at the Greater Vancouver Board of Trade, or policy analysts at Natural Resources Canada, or senior sustainability analysts at Gold Core, or senior communications and engagement lead at Translink. I'm sure she's quite busy right now. And we also have China Associate UN Support Principles for Responsible Investment in Beijing. So such a variety of roles in so many different fields, walking in their individual journeys, we're always happy to connect with them. And for more stories about them, you can sign up for any of our newsletters, go to our website, go to our YouTube, go to our Instagram. We're always sharing stories about our alumni because we're so proud of them. So just to close, I'm going to ask one question to both of our alumni here today. What is one piece of advice you would like to give to people who are interested in this program? Um, so, mine is, uh, probably sounds kind of cliche, but uh, it would just be open-minded. Um, I think, I mean, in our cohort it was mostly international, uh, or, or pretty close to half and half. Um, and, yeah, you're going to learn as much, if not more, from the people that you're from in your cohort than you will at, uh, in the courses. Um, so, yeah, just, just be open-minded. Yeah, I was going to say the same, but uh, I think, yeah, just being curious and take advantage of all the resources that are available to you, because they're only available when you're a student, and then when you graduate, they're gone, so take full advantage of all the resources that work. <laughs> That's very true. All right, well, thank you so much to you two. Thank you so much for all of you for coming here today. We'll be hanging out and networking with everyone afterwards. So if you still have any lingering questions, please don't hesitate to ask.